I've been asked throughout my entire career, how do you get to the position you're at? How do you, how do you become a top producer? And a lot of people assume that it's luck. Some people think that it's talent. And some people think that I used to swan into a meeting, a board level meeting, and just groove my way through it. It was all just came so easily to me. And I wanted to show people that that couldn't be further from the truth. And it was a mindset, a strategy, and a process that I applied to every scenario to make sure that I was over-prepared and I was ready for every scenario. And Hey y'all, welcome to Selling with Social, the podcast that helps marketers increase marketing qualified leads, sales reps to shatter sales results, and sales leaders to grow as leaders. Each show, we interview sales, marketing, and social media practitioners, leaders, and influencers to help you connect, close more deals, build stronger relationships with clients, and improve your sales productivity. I'm Mario Martinez Jr., You're now listening to Selling with Social. Today's guest on Selling with Social is Lee Bartlett. He is a consultant, author of the highly acclaimed book, The Number One Bestseller, and a specialist in taking new technology products to market. With extensive experience selling to the financial sector and C-suite executives, Lee has built multinational sales teams, been the co-founder and CEO of tech startup, and has sold extensively across Europe, the US, and Asia. On this episode, he shares his personal sales methodology and experiences directly from his book and from his blog writing. This is somebody that you will want to listen to and follow. So you're now listening to Selling with Social. Lee Bartlett, man, I am freaking pumped that you are here on my show, Selling with Social, today. This is going to be a fantastic conversation. And you know what I love best about you, Lee? Go on. (laughs) What I love best is that you are a diehard sales guy and that wrote a book, literally wrote a book. And it's one of the few that I've read that are actually from a salesperson not an influencer, not a sales leader of some sort, but a true sales guy giving practical tips. So I cannot wait for everybody on this show to listen to what you've got to say. So Lee, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mario. Yeah, I look forward to it. I don't want too much joking here. Let's be serious, right? Yeah. (laughs) No joking at all. (laughs) Listen, do me a favor. Tell our audience a little about yourself. Sure. Well, I had a long career in sales. I did pretty well at it. I worked in enterprise solutions. I worked in transactional sales environments. I've sold very high value, high pressure deals. And I've sold extensively across Europe, US and Asia. And I wrote a book and the book's called The Number One Bestseller. And it maps my progress throughout my entire career. It shares some of the things that I did well, some of the things that I didn't do so well. And it tries to share in particular the things that I did that allowed me to consistently win the biggest mandates in my industry and work myself to a top salesperson position. I love it. I've studied your social profiles. Obviously, I'm on social. I'm a social guy. So I'm no, come- you're not. No, <laughs> I've seen you on LinkedIn, Mario. <laughs> you couldn't have figured that out from, uh, from your feed, huh? <laughs> you, is it overwhelming you yet? <laughs> it's, uh, I'm, I'm in awe. I want your profile. It's perfect. <laughs> I love it. Uh, what I want to know from you and what our listeners want to know, if we looked at uh, your social profiles, We can Mm -hmm. see a lot of data, a lot of information about you. But what is one thing nobody would know about you by looking at any of your social profiles? Something that they they wouldn't be able to find out? Uh, Gosh, you're getting in there deep straight off, aren't you? Uh, Straight off. I have a 10-year-old daughter. How about that? The love of my life. So you'd never see her on any of my social. She's uh, my little secret, my little gem. So yeah, I keep that just to myself. (laughs) <laughs> okay, fair enough. Ten-year-old daughter. Well, I love. So we've got we've got author, we've got amazing sales guy, and we've got dad. All proud. Right. The, the proudest part. The, the <laughs> awesome. All right. So your background in sales. Let's talk a little bit about that. You obviously have spent your entire career in sales. I want to know what made you decide to be a book author. Like one day you walked away from corporate, I think it was, and then you decided to write a book. Like, well, tell me about, tell us about that. Kind of. The book started as a memo to my team. I was on a plane on the way to Stockholm and I was uh, pulling my hair out because my team were, were just, they kept asking me, you know, uh, what should we do? What should we do? 
So uh, I sat down and started to write this 10 bullet points, which actually formed the section of the book called The Basics. And by the time I'd landed, three hours later, I thought this would make a great book. So I, I, I didn't send it. <laughs> I, I, I shelved the, the memo <laughs> selfishly. <laughs> I love it. So what did you, how did you help them? <laughs> you yeah, didn't. exactly. Yeah, really generous of me. But, um, I didn't send it and, and I sat it there. And because I was traveling so much, I started to pad it out on the way to pitches and to, to see clients. And I ended up with about 10,000 words. And then I thought, great, you know, this is, this is, this is awesome. But, but I kind of just forgot about it, to be honest, Mario. And then I, I finished that job. I, I went and moved to, a, to another firm and I was working pretty intensely. And uh, again, I came back to it maybe a year and a half later. And I thought, you know, I really need to finish this project. So I started to get serious about it and work on it a lot. And I ended up with 40,000 words, 50,000 words, something like that. And I thought, well, this is a book. And then I gave it to an editor and they said to me, it's too complicated. It's too complex. There's no lead in. Anybody who's new to sales would never really understand how you got to the point that you're describing. So I went back and I wrote the first section of the book, which is how I pick a product. And it, it looks, it maps my career from right at the beginning when I just left university, right the way up to how I learned what I call the basics. Uh-huh. It was kind of the bridge. So then I, I had a full book uh, and then I wanted to finish it off with some of the finer things that I like contract negotiation and things that mistakes I'd made in my career. And I ended up with a holistic view of, uh, of my entire career and the things that I did differently from others. It's not common that you'd find a true salesperson that would take this journey and actually document the journey from the beginning through to the end and give practical tips. Now, I, I definitely spent time reading the book. And one yeah. of the areas that I, I went to was the employment contract negotiation. I, we don't have so much of that here in the States on our side, but I thought it was interesting in terms of some of the insights that you were offering to folks. And, and obviously your audience is an international audience as ours is. So it was really well thought out. That's for sure. And gave some, um, some great points in terms of how actually people can think through the strategy process of becoming and or being a top salesperson, right? Yeah, well, it was a liberating thing, if I'm honest, because I had the benefit of 12 months reflecting on what I was doing naturally that allowed me to to be a top sales professional in a variety of different roles. You know, what was it in that environment and what was it in the next environment and how do they interlink and what is it about my style that allowed me to win some of these very high value deals. So it was a great process as a salesperson. I mean, I recommend every salesperson goes through it. And then, you know, you get to pick out all of your failings. It would be such a boring book if it was just a big I am and how great I am. But I tried to share almost controversial points of view to some scenarios to show that I wasn't perfect and that I struggled and there were obstacles, but this is how I, I overcame them. Yeah. So I, I, I try to do that with a bit of humor. It's a very serious undertone, but, but I try to show how, um, how I approached every, every environment and, and get myself into the, the dominant position. The book is called The Number One Best Seller, and it was published <laughs> in 2016. But we'll actually make sure we put that into the show notes along with a link to where you can purchase the book. And I highly recommend that you get the book. So you, you've touched on this just a little bit about kind of your methodology, what made you write the book and, and how you started it. You, you, <laughs> you didn't give it to your, your team who was asking your questions. You were like, wait a minute, this is the <laughs> information I've got. And then a, a year later, you, come, you came back to it and you're like, you wanted to finish it. But was there anything that, was there any inspiration that inspired you to write the book, to finish the book off? It was, yeah, it was a, a number of reasons. Well, it's perfectionism for one because I'd started it and I don't like to start any project and not finish it. But it was really to answer the question, how did you do it? I've been asked throughout my entire career, how do you get to the position you're at? How do you you become a top producer? And a lot of people assume that it's luck. Some people think that it's talent. And some people think that I used to swan into a meeting, a board level meeting, and just groove my way through it. It was all just came so easily to me. And I wanted to show people that that couldn't be further from the truth. And it was a mindset, a strategy, and a process that I applied to every scenario to make sure that I was over-prepared and I was ready for every scenario. And so I tried to share that, and I thought that was valuable to share with everybody so that they can can perhaps replicate it. Now, the book doesn't tell anybody what to do. It's how I did it. So I'm hoping that people can read it and translate it to their individual perspective and their situation. 
Got it. And we're going to touch on the secret to sales success. Uh, actually, I have a quote directly from the book from page 83, which I really like. So we'll, we'll come back okay. to that, that concept there. Tell me, there's a lot of sales related books that are out there to help us yeah. be better at selling, to help us be more productive, help us to uh, build better relationships, to help us uh, have a better phone voice. I mean, there's, a, there's thousands upon thousands of sales books. For our listeners, just help me understand, what is different about this book versus all the other sales books that are available today on being a better salesperson? Do, do you think there's anything different other than it's your personal journey? Yeah, I mean, to put that into perspective, I had never read a sales book in my life until I had written my book. So I I had no, and that was intentional while I was writing the book as well, because I thought if I read someone else's stuff, I might be tempted to nick it. Mm. So that thing came out of my soul. So because it came from that place and it came entirely from my experiences and from what I'd learned, it had to be unique. How how could it be the same as anybody else? So What's the value in it? I've never seen or I've never heard of another top salesperson document their path and share what they felt were the things that differentiated themselves through their career. So I kind of wrote it as a case study. Yeah. <laughs> almost, almost like it wasn't me. And that's why I, I kept the integrity in it. I kept it honest. I kept a lot of my faults, my failings in it as well. And I'm hoping that salespeople will read it and then go, wow, that's what's required. It's not luck or talent. And I'm hoping that sales managers will read it and go, that's what my top salesperson acts like. And maybe I'm doing it differently. So I'm hoping it, it, I'm doing it incorrectly, not differently. I'm hoping that it gives people the opportunity to reflect as well on, on, on what they're reading and, uh, and build it into their work process. Well, let's get down and dirty. Let's get some depth into this discussion here. On go on, some, bring, on it, bring it, bring <laughs> three, it. I want three things that you want the sales community to walk away with when they have read the number one bestseller? I want them to understand the mindset of a top producer is to win. It's just to win. It's that simple. It's pitching every deal like it's the last deal you'll ever pitch. Now I say pitch, everybody winces when presentation and pitch, those words come up. <laughs> but, but sometimes in some of the environments that I work, you've got 45 minutes to make a point. You're not going in asking a series of questions. You've got to have a very concise delivery. So take it in the spirit with which I say it. So that's the mindset. You know, and, and I was lucky enough, a lot of people would consider this a curse, but I was lucky enough to pitch myself against brilliant competitors. So I had to bring my A game to the table. And my clients were very smart people. They were senior investment bankers and they were C-suite executives. So I, my mindset was to get myself into a position where I could handle anything in those environments. So that's where I was coming from. Yeah, let's go with the front cover of the book. Strategy. You could be brilliant at sales skill sets, but it's pointless without a strategy. And I want people to see that the strategic approach that I took to generating what I call invisible revenue, revenue that isn't on the table. I mean, there was one story in there where I actively lost deals on purpose. I was overpricing them so that I could win a bigger deal on the back of it. These are strategic decisions that no one teaches you. So the strategy is the second element, and the process is what I call the basics. So these are the things that I did on a daily basis and on every deal that I think set me apart. So all three of those are in the book, and if you want to understand how top salespeople do it, there it is. Gotcha. And most top salespeople think that they've got the winning mindset, believe, not think, believe that they have the winning mindset, believe that they've got a strategy, believe that they have a, a defined process. I think that most people would, would feel that way about themselves. Yeah. But if you just took strategy as an example, and you gave an example of, of the invisible revenue model, and yeah. that was pricing high so that you can actually win something on the back end. Drill down for a second in, on strategy, that maybe something that from, from the book that you can pull out and give to our audience and say, here's an example of what you think is a good strategy, but really the best strategy was. Is there something like that you can give us? Yeah, absolutely. There is a story in the book that does that. There was an occasion, uh, and the story was listed, where my company had been blacklisted from a certain buyer for whatever reason. It's not relevant. And I had to break into that account. Now, I had two options to get into that account. It was a dead loss account, so we had nothing to lose, right? 
but it wasn't just nothing to lose. It was the second biggest bank in the world. So what are my options? My options were to go in high, try and leverage some form of warm referral to the head of the investment bank, a very risky, highly unlikely strategy, put all my eggs into one basket and try and get in that way and get him to override the blacklisting below him, go senior. Or the other strategy, which was a lot more work, it was a pain, was to go in low, build some uh, trust at the very granular level and work my way up to the mid-level, proving myself, gain the trust of the mid-level once again, convince them that, that blacklisting us was the wrong thing to do, gain their recommendation up to procurement, and then get them on side and get the whole organization behind me to then push me up to the most senior player. Now, you would have been forgiven for going in at the high level because it was just a pun, it was nothing to lose, and trying to work, trying to be over, to override the team below. But it was wrong. It was a lot easier, but it was absolutely wrong. And, and the story in the book shows the, pro, the strategy and the process behind how that account was broken into, and it actually became our biggest account in Europe. That reminds me of one of my own personal stories. And this actually was in 2003, I believe it was, uh, or 2002. I was actually part of an organization that was a startup company. And the startup company was a half a billion dollar funded startup company. The company that was funding it decided to pull the, uh, the funding from, from the program. And they asked me to stay behind as one of the few of the thousands of employees that they had to actually close out and transition all the work out. And I said, yes. And then they, uh, they gave me a role in the mothership organization as an enterprise account executive account manager, whatever you want to call it. And I remember that I was given a deck of accounts and they were the dog meat. <laughs> a, weren't buying. B, if they had bought, they were super ticked off at us. They had nothing to do with us. And I remember there was an account. It was a, one of the largest retailers in the world. Mm. And we had a fairly healthy size worth of, of billing inside there, but we had a contract that had expired. And I, that was January. I tried for 60 some odd days to get a hold of anybody in the organization. And I just, nothing. Finally, one day I got somebody and it happened to be the mid-level manager. He picked up the phone. It was six o'clock at night. He picked up the phone. He thought it was somebody else. And I told him who I was. And he cussed me out with the F word, every other word for <laughs> one hour, one hour. But it reminds me of, of you know, the, 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 of the strategy that you just mentioned that a lot of folks think about going in and selling at high, which you need to do. You need to have yeah, you part of your strategy, right? Yep. But the reality is, is that the influencers that are at the bottom and or the middle have just as much power and play in today's organization with the idea that leaders are pushing down decisions mm -hmm. as the top does. Mm -hmm. And so that conversation, he was so ticked off at me, but he wasn't not me. He didn't even know me from Adam, but he was so ticked off at our organization that he had actually served us to, through to the legal department, his notice of cancellation. And furthermore said that he had 24 months of hundreds of thousands of dollars of bad billing. 24 months. And there was absolutely no desire whatsoever. And so I said, look, you don't know me from Adam, but if I were to fix this problem in 40 days, I pulled a number out of my butt, literally. <laughs> on that. Yeah, yeah. I pulled it out of my butt. On, if I, I was like, the guy was, you know, what did I have to lose? And if I could fix this in 40 days for you, would you at least give us a second chance to even consider having further conversations? And it was funny. He said to me, all right, You've got 40 days. And the reason why, I remember his name was Don. D D I'm going to send this to Don Palster, actually. Uh, the, uh, the, the reason why he did that was because he wanted to, he wanted to give it a kick. He wanted to have another story you could tell internally to how we screwed up. <laughs> but that's what we had to do. And it took us 40 days. And by golly, I issued an over quarter million dollar credit on that account on the 39th day before it was the 40th day was due. That company actually re-signed a contract and for the first time in their history, signed a three-year long-term agreement as a renewal, plus actually bought hundreds of thousands of dollars more. So I love your, your point there. And for sales folks that are listening, I think there's a, the strategy is an all-encompassing element. And at Lee's book really goes into talking about from a seller's perspective, like some practical items in terms of making sure that you don't forget about those at the bottom. Lee, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it takes discipline. It really does. And, and that's another 
attribute of a, of a professional salesperson, that they have the discipline to do what's necessary to break that account. It, it's, it's tempting to take the easy route, but it was too big an account to take an undisciplined approach and it was broken. So yeah. how, do you, how do you mend something that's broken? It's to just gently rebuild it. You know, you're already walking on eggshells just by even stepping in there. You're blacklisted. You've got to have a, a bulletproof belief that you're adding value to that place. And, and we did. I mean, when I got up the ladder to the mid-level, they were the nicest. We're still friends years later. Yeah. We're still friends. I worked on so many deals with those people. They, they're, they're wonderful. But, and you know what? As a salesperson, it's highly satisfying to turn around a dead loss. That's, yeah. that's what you get up for, right? Absolutely. You've turned around a, a dead loss account into your biggest revenue generator in Europe. That's what it's about to me. Well, so. especially, you know, if you come onto a sales organization and they create a new sales position, and I always love it how sales managers, oh, the, you know, we're growing, we need to be able to grow, so we're going to give you a fantastic deck of accounts. No great salesperson gives away a fantastic account. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you gotta, you got to peel that thing off me. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you're like, you're, 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 you're fighting someone to be able to get a great account. So either you're getting the dog meat of account, accounts that never have bought. And to get those type of, and when you get them and you win them and you yeah. strategy, you do, uh, your, your mindset, right? And the, the strategy, the mindset to win and a process, a methodology that is right. mapped out. And I love the way you mapped out a lot of your thought process. And, and I think that's important for salespeople to understand that, you know, whether it's that, a dog meat account or an account you're trying to win as a brand new logo, whatever the case might be. Those three things that you just laid out, mindset, strategy, and process, that's the money ticket right there for the sales community. Yeah, it, it, it's what, what, what it's really about. Anyone can learn a sales technique. It's not hard. I could teach any sales technique in a very short period of time, but they're useless to someone unless they've got those three things, drive, mindset, strategy, and process. So, yeah. 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 Moving on to another question here. Three yeah. things that you would want our sales community to stop doing right now. Oh, my bugbear that I cannot bear. And, and you know, when I, when I was running a team, I, I couldn't bear it either. Did you say not, bear? My bugbear? Yeah, yeah. My bugbear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> must, my, <laughs> I love that. I never heard it before. Bugbear. I'm going to start using that one. Yeah, well, that's, that's English manners. That's my that's polite English way of manners. saying okay, it. Okay, I love it. In the office, I would probably have another way of saying it. But, uh, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it's not responding. It drives me insane. Be responsive to your customer, be responsive to everybody. I read a stat the other day from InsideSales.com that said the average lead takes something outrageous 48 hours until it gets responded to, if at all. I mean, if that happened in my team, you'd see a mushroom cloud over London. It would just be a nuclear. It would, I just couldn't handle it. So, so yeah, just respond, timely fashion. It's often a differentiator, Mario. That, that's what drives me nuts. The fact that, that you was, I mean, my clients would be working very long hours, senior investment bankers, when a deal's going off, they're working all hours. They'd yeah. be in the office all night. So they're going to work with the person who responds to them within 25 seconds. And it's a habit that, that I'm in now, even now. Yeah. I mean, Graham Hawkins, I don't know, you, you must know one of the sales influence. He, he emails me at two in the morning. I just respond immediately. He can't get his head around it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just in me. That, you know, I like responding. I like showing people that I'm good for my word and that I'm responsive. But, and if you're not doing that, and you're coming across a good salesperson, you're finished, because they're going to be the one that gets the mandate. Good advice. Yeah, no, I, I have the same issue too. <laughs> 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 Try to do lightning, lightning level responses. Uh, for somehow, some reason though, uh, after I started my own practice, 500 emails behind. So I, I don't know how that happened. But <laughs> <laughs> it just becomes more difficult every day. But no, I, I love that. And I think... A lot of, you know, it's funny. I saw that stat too from Inside Sales about the lack of responsiveness. And I think most sales folks would probably say that. I don't know how that's possible. Yeah, I thought it was a joke. They are supposedly following up, but I probably would take it one step further, Lee. And it's not just responding to the lead. It's actually responding with insightful information. Yeah. Right. I was at a conference and a sales manager walked up to me and said, hi, you're Mario. And I was like, yeah, hi. He's like, I'm, I forget the gentleman's name, John. Let's just say his name was John. And I was like, Hey John, he was like, you don't know me. And I was like, no, I don't think so. Do we know each other? Am I supposed to know? You? He's like, <laughs> no, but you had sent an email to our uh, chief revenue officer that was showcasing one of my sales reps and the lack of insightful messaging that they sent <laughs> that put in. 
<laughs> and I said, oh, are you from such and such company? And they said, yeah. And I said, oh, hi. <laughs> and he was like, and he goes, I just wanted to say to you, thank you. Yeah, that's the right answer. Yeah, right? I mean, like, you're like, welcome. I was I was surprised, right? But but the, the email came to me within like ten seconds of me submitting some information online, right? Put my information online, and it was standard canned pitch crap, and, and it was just like take open the can, and you had the dog food inside, and you just slopped it out on a bowl, and you just threw it in front of me, and I sent it off to the CRO and said, "Look, I sent you a message saying here is a specifically what I'm looking for. Your rep took your can process." and responded back with something that was just garbage, right? It was the can right. step one, step two, step three, step four email. And I was like, you lost me and I went to a competitor. But I want to help you because this is how we get better as sales oriented. He actually, I didn't know this. He took that email and he forwarded it out to 220 salespeople worldwide and said, this is what you're not supposed to do. Good for him. And, and I, was, I, was, I, was, I was shocked. I mean, who would have known? But yeah, Respect. you're right. Yeah, well, and he's right too. And he was, know, I'm glad he did it. He never knocked it on the head. He never said yeah. thanks, but, <laughs> but he got back to me five months later, you know, at a conference where somebody found me at the conference. It was, it was quite, quite comical, but uh, we had, a, we had a drink. I gave, I bought him a drink. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things I've always told candidates when I was a hiring leader, uh, trying to switch gears here is that when they interviewed with me, there were two things that they got to choose. Number one, who they work for. And number two, what company they worked for. So choose yeah. wisely. You spend a lot of time in the book towards the back half discussing how to select a company you want to sell for. And I want to spend a, a moment just talking about for those looking for that next job opportunity. There's a lot of sales folks that are listening or even marketers, right? Uh, individuals, period, social media folks that are looking for their next opportunity or even their first sales opportunity. What advice would you give them incorporating some of your things that you incorporated in the book? I hate to give advice, Mario. Is this, I, I don't want to cop out of it. I, like, I just like to talk about the things that, that I look for. Sure. Because, because advising someone on their career and telling them the things that they should be looking for is a big thing to do. You know, it's, it, 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 they're not me, so they might not be looking at the things that I'm looking for. But I found out early in my career that I look for a certain profile of product that suits my personality, and that's a product that's low on the product adoption curve. So I look for new products. And I like to take them to market. And there's a number of reasons for that. It, it means that I can move very quickly. I can leverage my networks very quickly. I can lock the product in before anybody else gets to market. I can set what we call traps, as you know. And I can pretty much, you know, for want of a better phrase, I can dominate the market because I can get it right. in there so fast that I can, I can get myself into a position where I'm, I'm the leading expert. And I did this on three occasions. So I, I have a set of 10 key markers, and I walk through them in the book, that experience taught me will either positively support my success or my path to being a top producer, or will detrimentally impact my ability to earn. And uh, some of the things that I share are, are quite seemingly innocuous. So I was going for a job once, and someone said, you know, uh, they're a great company, but boy, do they have a high staff turnover. And I thought, so what? I mean, it doesn't affect me. I mean, as long as I get free run of the market and I can drill my product in as fast as possible, it, it makes no impact. But it's an incredibly naive thing to do, to think that you can just smash through any form of political issues that are going on within a company that is causing people to leave or, or, or to churn staff. So that's one of the elements, one of the 10 that I discuss, that I look for. Yeah, I, I try to pick very, very carefully because... I don't view or I never viewed the concept of work as a fun activity that was just going to take up the majority of my life. Uh, I, I view working as an investment of my time, you know, and it's, it's an investment that yields the maximum return that supports my family and so on. So I, I just look for products with the most upside. I looked at it as an investor would look at it and uh, I analyze the product. I do an awful lot of research before I even consider approaching the company or working for the company to make sure that I, I have a clear path to my personal goals. And I think that that's one of the key attributes of top sales professionals. I think that they pick the right products and they have that product support who they are and their best strengths, their better strengths. That's some great advice there. And I think it's important for sales and marketers to really 
do that research on the company that they are desirous to work for. And sometimes we're in a bind. Sometimes we take opportunities because we have to, right? We feel like there's, you know, yeah. we're, we're, we're strapped for cash or it's time to go or, you know, some, whatever the case might be. But to your point, hopefully, if you are applying the research that you would normally apply to sell to a company, that same strategy, in my opinion, if you use that to determine if you want to work for that company, because then you, then that will help you determine, can I sell for that company, right? And I think that's very important. It's so, so important. It is the majority of your life. Why are you not taking every granular approach? I mean, the, the approach that I used to take was that I needed to be clear of how I was going to hit my target before I stepped foot in the building. So I wouldn't even consider, and I didn't care what the sales director told me. It goes back to your point earlier. Here's a great account deck. Uh, I'm not interested in what the sales director is telling me is a great account deck. I've all, I'm deciding. I'm talking to the customers before I even step foot in the building and, and asking them, look, is this a great product to work for? Would you buy it? How do you feel about it? So I'm, I'm getting myself into a, position, into a position where day one, I'm firing on full, on full cylinders. I'm just executing. That's what I want to do, all of that preparation. And I think that's key. I think it's important. I shared how I did it. That's it. Yeah, I love it. And I think there's, you know, for those of you that are interested in finding the next great opportunity, our listeners, and or you're fresh out of college and you're looking for that opportunity in the number one bestseller here, Lee Bartlett's book, I, I think you're going to find some valuable insight in terms of what you should do and how you should go about selecting your next opportunity and uh, making sure that you feel comfortable that you can actually sell the strategy and the company and, and the, the technology behind it. Lee, I want to move on into something that I, I just loved. Lots of things I liked about the book, but this is actually my favorite part. Can I, can I okay. share that with you? Please. For, for those of you that are listening, when you get your copy of the book, you're going to want to turn, what, we're going to read the whole book, but page 83, <laughs> page 83, and this is actually a story of you working for a sales manager who was giving you some advice, and I think you had a viewpoint of how great you were, and yeah. he had a different viewpoint, if I'm not mistaken, that's how the story worked here, and you spend a lot of time after this talking about the secret to sales success. And this is what you, uh, you said here. He explained that one salesperson he most admired during his career had told him that the secret to sales success is simply to be brilliant at the basics. And then you said, his feedback on my performance was that although my incredible run of sales success to date had put me ahead of my years in terms of experience, I had yet to truly internalize and believe in the basics. They needed to flow naturally for me at every point of client contact and understanding their value was essential to making the most of every opportunity. I, I'm, I'm going to steal that. Uh, can I steal that? In, 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 in <laughs> please, a, all right. please. I'll give you credit for that. But, but this, this I've, is- I've got goosebumps while you're reading that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got Honestly, goosebumps. <laughs> I have, I have. Man. So, so expand on that. Wait, to, to talk a little bit about this concept of the secret to sales success is simply to be brilliant at the basics. What, 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 what does that mean to our audience? Tell us what that means. The whole book is about what that means because he never told me what it meant. But we're talking about the most brilliant enterprise sales solution salesperson I've ever seen in my life now. And I was lucky enough at the beginning of my career to have him guide me. He was a different level. I, just before that paragraph, I say, I've never felt such a feeling of inadequacy watching somebody conduct a meeting yeah, yeah. in the way that, that he conducted our first meeting together. I realized what a rookie I was. And, uh, you know, these things stay with you for your whole career. Yeah. And so, you know, he, he told me that story. He, he said, Lee, you know, exactly as you just read. And I immediately needed to understand what the basics were. And that entire section is my interpretation of what the basics are. It's the things that you do that differentiate you. It's not basic sales techniques. They do nothing for you. That's not true. They don't do nothing for you. They do little for you. They're a tiny piece of the equation. It's the softer things. It's all of the incremental. It's how you glue them all together. And the basics is, in my opinion, the most powerful thing that I could ever share because it, it genuinely is what I felt gave me the edge over everybody else. 
when I applied it. So that's what I, I took as the basics is, Mario. I don't know. And, and you know, it's such a personal story for me. Yeah. That 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 it, it gets me all riled up. You know, just it makes me want to just you know slam a new product into the market immediately. It just it just I just love it. Lee, so Lee and I, for those of you listening, we're about to hug here. He's about to cry. <laughs> 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 on iPad. <laughs> <laughs> not, not all that bad. There we go. But we, we talk about the basics. I, I want to give like give our listeners an example of something about the basics. And I've got okay. a story, and it it, okay. it it has to do with really asking the right questions about who your competition is, right? I mean, but tell us what what what. Give us an example of something. What what are the basics? Uh, they're personal for a start. They're not they're not the same for everybody. They are uh, a personal list. So, so there's 10 of them in there. Uh, one of them, how did I manage to, how did I learn to master my ego dealing with difficult clients, you know, being uber competitive and wanting to win? How do you maintain your professional integrity in front of a client and make sure that doesn't impact them? Uh, how do you identify invisible revenue? People always say, you know, don't leave money on the table, but no one tells you how to do it. Yeah. So I, I built a strategy a number of strategies, which you'll read in that section of how to identify that. And, and in the first instance is to separate it out from the current conversation. So I had a, uh, an independent strategy that I would, I would always come back to, to identify invisible revenue. How do you quantify what working hard is, what you can get out of a day? People say work hard. No one tells you what that means. So there's the first one. I think that's number one of the basics. You know, how to maintain, how did I maintain a vision, a personal goal, and build in a strategy. What was my mental approach to building in a strategy to hitting my targets? Uh, how did I speak to people? How do I conduct myself in front of clients? Who tells you how to do that? Someone can say, oh, you know, just don't do this, but that's not enough. Yeah. I built in layers that controlled my verbiage in front of clients. I mentioned them in there, you know, I discuss things as being reasonable and unreasonable as opposed to acceptable and unacceptable. And what that does is before what I'm saying comes out of my mouth, it intrinsically benchmarks what I'm about to say. So all of these, these things, I mean, there's, there's hundreds of them in there, but all of these things that you put together, they, they build up the basics. And I finish with a story that shows the importance of all of them. It brings them all together. And it's, it's in the section called Hungry, Greedy, and Never Give Up. And it's a story of how I clawed back a deal from a lost position and the importance of doing the basics, even though I'd initially won the deal. So I won the deal, then I lost it, and then I pulled it back. So even though I got the initial mandate to begin with, I still went through the processes that I go through as a matter of habit. And then when I lost it, because I'd done those, I was able to claw it back. So it's, it's trying to show people how to do it, the process, and that it isn't luck. It's a contrived set of skills and it's a mindset strategy and process. I love it. Great. I want to change gears again here. And you know, I'm a passionate uh, seller and I'm a passionate social seller as well. There's a lot of folks that are out there that say social selling is the only thing that works or social selling doesn't work. You know, you know, my beliefs, I'm a hybrid. You got to use everything and anything to be able to reach your customer. Do you believe in social selling? Does yes. it work? Why or why not? Yes. Uh, I, I think it's absolutely preposterous to say that it has no value. So in fact, I don't even like the whole social seller, outbound seller debate. It's nonsense. They both complement each other. In fact, I have a blog releasing about this. They are, why wouldn't you want more skills and more techniques to increase your network, to communicate with your customer and to bring inbound leads? I just don't get it, Mario. But what I do get is this, as, a, as a, an outbound salesperson, it's time consuming and it takes quite a bit to quantify and to get going in the first place. It takes quite a bit to build a personal brand. It takes time out of a day where you feel like you're, you're most productive in an outbound role. So I understand why the hesitation. I understand that people say it's a marketing role. I get that too because historically it was, but I don't believe that's the case anymore. I believe with the changes in the customer journey and the buy-in habit, marketing and sales are the same. They're not the same, but, but they're- Relatively close. They're very, very closely aligned these days. And if they're not, you've got a problem. So yes, does it work? Of course it works. In fact, I've just released a research study 
that shows the efficacy of both. I interviewed a company that uh, made $1.3 million in pipeline revenue in 90 days by beginning a company-wide social selling campaign. And I also uh, interviewed another company that doubled their inbound revenues by start in Europe by starting a uh, outbound team to uh, to complement the efforts uh, when they expanded the U.S. company when they expanded into Europe. So it is undeniable. It's a ridiculous statement to say that neither of them have value, and they should be in this day and age. They should be worked together. I love it. Great answer. You mentioned something about the buyer's journey changing. How has it changed over your career, and what do you foresee as the future changes? Information overload has got to be the number one thing that I hear these days. You know, why buyers are choosing, certainly in the UK, buyers are choosing to do nothing Mm. rather than try and make sense from the noise. And that in itself will drive vendor consolidation. So they they want to work with more trusted advisors to help them aggregate the noise and to uh, make sense of the madness and help them procure. So that's one change that we never used to have. Customers used to just rely on the salesperson to educate them. Uh, I think that that still is the case more in the UK than in the US. Uh, And my research study touches on this and the reasons for that. Uh, But the other thing that I see as well that is a big change is uh, the increasingly systematic procurement approach. Back in, uh, you know, five years ago, in those days, you could pretty much do a deal with an end user. You could just yeah. go in there. But, but these days in the B2B environment, the B2B data space, it's naive to think that you're not going to hit a buyer committee and you're not going to have to deal with that as part of your process. And I think that's having a number of effects on sales organizations in that it's exposing poorly executed sales processes. So the days of the lazy salesperson that just ride the crest of new business adoption, they're over. Yeah. This is, this is a big implication for the companies that I speak to now. And uh, you need to be prepared, strategic, professional, social, and right on the money to be selling in this market. I love it. That's uh, some, uh, some great insights, and I cannot disagree with you whatsoever. <laughs> it's amazing to me, though, how many articles I see from sales influencers and sales leaders that are in senior leadership positions that just don't get the value of social. And, and, and to your point, the one challenge that it does bring is, is that you can play on social all day long and not have any, any, any benefit hit you. So there's one thing I would like to, to add to that dynamic. You know, I hear a lot of criticism about sales uh, leaders being dinosaurs or not adopting it. And I think that the people that sometimes target this criticism, they're not appreciating the uh, implications for making one small change to a big organization. So there's a lot of leaders out there that have lived through the must-have or die customer CRM revolution, where they've massively over-invested in tech and got very little return for it. And all they've really done is confuse their workforce. (laughs) So there there is an argument that says, well, let's let it settle a little bit. Let other people test the water first and prove its efficacy, and then we'll start to adopt it. So I think, I think it's more complex than people give it credit for. And it's, it's justifiable for these people who, who have massive budgets and massive workforces to take a more cautious view. However, I don't see the growth of social networks going backwards. Neither of us do. And I don't see technological innovation declining either. It may do, but I don't see it. I, I don't feel like it will. So they must begin to make small steps in this direction to digitally transform. Yeah. Yeah. Good points. Good points. Lee, if someone wants to connect with you, reach out, ask you any questions, what's the best way to contact you? I like to think I'm everywhere, Mario, but (laughs) that's not the case. Uh, My book's on Amazon, please. Amazon, iTunes, all the usual suspects. Uh, Reach me. uh, My website's leebartlettbestseller.com. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. I love being tweeted. Please tweet me. I used to hate that platform, but I love it now. And uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a hard man to find. So uh, love to connect with people and, uh, and welcome it. Is it okay for them to connect with you on LinkedIn, meaning send you a connection request? Please. Please, okay. why not? Yeah. All right. Very good. And to reach out, we'll make sure you put your, uh, your website into the show notes as well. One more time, just do me a favor. The number one bestseller, it's obviously a perfect book for anybody who's in sales, especially a, a way to continue off in the 2017 year here. Where can our listeners get a copy of the number one bestseller? 
Amazon is the best place. Yeah. I mean, it's on all the usual suspects. As I said, it's on uh, iTunes. It's on Amazon. But uh, please go to Amazon. You go for, via my website, if you like, LeeBartlettBestseller.com. But it's, it should be easy to find. And leave a book review, right? <laughs> please. <laughs> yeah. Don't just buy it if you like it. If you like it, yeah. Only, only good book <laughs> yeah. reviews. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's hard to get uh, people to give book reviews, but uh, might I can understand it. that. I never used to. So, uh, well, but, you know, yeah, but, me neither, quite frankly. All right, very good. Well, Lee, man, it's been fantastic having you on Selling with Social. I can't thank you enough, my friend. The number one bestseller by Lee Bartlett fantastic book, practical strategy, mindset, process, everything you need to understand in terms of how to be a better and a top salesperson. So Lee, thanks for joining me here today. And I look forward to uh, having you on the next show for your next book. Thanks for listening to the Selling with Social podcast. I'm super pumped that you are our guest today. Here's what I want you to do right now. Go to M, the number three, jr.com forward slash podcast. And support our podcast, please, by distributing it out anywhere you can get it to on social. And don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes. You'll find all the instructions there on the site on how to subscribe to the Selling with Social podcast. Until the next show, keep on rocking. Mario Martinez Jr. <laughs>